Arab American Faces and Voices, The Origins of an Immigrant Community, is a book that documents the lives of the first Arab immigrants to the town of Worcester, Massachusetts, between 1880 and 1915. Published in 2003, the book is the fruit of 16 years of research, writing, and editing by its author Elizabeth Busada, a descendant of the immigrants whose stories she relates, and a resident of the city of Worcester, where she is an active participant in the cultural and political life of the city. It came about because I have an, an uh, affinity with elder people, and I used to visit the older folks, family, relatives, or even people who I wouldn't know, I'd knock at their door if they were older because I just loved being in the company of the older people. And while I did that, I did uh, um, interview them. And when I was doing that, they would bring out their real old photographs like, uh, like this 1898 photo. And I said I didn't want it because I didn't realize it was an old photo. They were people from, when they were in Lebanon, and they had very modern-looking clothes that we have today. And then when I turned it over, it had the history of it, so I accepted it. So what I'm trying to say is we have so many stereotype images, even I in my own mind, that needed to be corrected. As a result of interviewing them, getting their uh, vintage uh, prints, I decided something has to be done with these treasures, and seeing that these were primary sources, they, they had to be saved, and more interviewing had to be done before they died, and their story wouldn't be told from the primary source. At the immigrants I interviewed were only the ones that came between the period of 1880 and 1915, and they had to be in their 80s and 90s, otherwise I wasn't interested in interviewing them. And then one man was aged 106. And he was really excited to visit because his grandson used to visit him every Wednesday to shave him. And we interviewed him on a Wednesday. And when we wanted to take his picture, he would have his hand a certain way. And then I would signal to the son to, I want his hands outstretched. So he would outstretch them. And as soon as we snapped the picture, he wasn't going to have us tell him how to hold his hand, so he kind of put them back. He, he was uh, exciting to, to be with. While these interviews constituted the central nucleus of the book, the stories had to be documented through years of painstaking research. Okay, I started like in 1889, and it took me to the date of publication about 16 years. But the reason for that is I would work uh, diligently for about two or three months at the time and then stop two or three months. I needed that kind of break. And then most of my work, most of the years were taking up in doing research for the book. And in order for me to get the sources, because of the uh, going back so far, a lot of the records were water stained or they were burned or else they were, uh, they were non-existent. I would have to spend lots of hours in the courthouse checking the registry of deeds and places like that. And um, I even went to the uh, a geneal genealogical uh, uh, Neches, New England Historical Genealogical Society in, uh, in uh, Boston. And there I found, um, I found record of, well I knew these, these Two families went to South America. They had a business down in South America for six months, and their wives took care of their grocery store uh, the other six months in Worcester. To give you an example of um, one incident, I wanted to um, date a building. It was built in um, 1898 by the Azar family, and, and it was a, 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 a four or five story double house, which means there was a center um, hallway going up and families on each side. So I, I used all the sources, the deeds, the courthouse, the water, sewer, uh, anything and everything. However, the way I was able to finally get it at the Department of Public Works, I went there and I said, this is the, this is the building and it has to be somewhere. And when I was 
arguing with them. Luckily, there was a, an elderly man in the office in the background. He got up. He says, come with me, lady. So I did without even questioning him. So we went upstairs, and he found the building in, of all places, in an insurance map. So we got the outline, and he was very kind. He asked the three men that came up with him to bring the heavy book down. It's a huge book, and they photographed just that section I needed, so I would have that for my source now. A another instance, a uh, man was naturalized in 1896, and I couldn't get any documentation through the usual sources, so oddly enough, there again, uh, the, the local City Hall, in the Registry of Voters, they had a record of his natural, naturalization in 1896. And this same man in 1901 is a, was a developer, and he, he developed a five-and-a-half-story commercial residential building, and it was very impressive. It had iron work on it, and then the sidewalk actually had glass cobblestones. I guess they have it in certain um, European places, but the purpose of that is to give daylight in the basement where, the, where there was additional um, stores and merchandise. The book is now in its second printing and has been well received by readers excited to see a publication on this topic. And what was so wonderful is I got calls from California and all, in, uh, all over the country commenting about the book because there's, there's such a lack of um, uh, written work about the Arab American immigrant and they have a history of being in America for almost, well, 125 years because they, I date 1880, but I, I know I could prove that they came earlier. And when I say they, I mean a mass migration. I'm not talking about Arabs who came one at a time. Busada's roots run deep in the community that she writes about, her grandfather being among the immigrants of the generation that is a subject of Arab American faces and voices. Busada's grandfather started as a pack peddler, a traveling salesman of dry goods throughout the region. From these humble beginnings, he made his way in America like so many other immigrants have done. And my grandfather, uh, he started as a pack peddler like all, no matter if you ask immigrants who came during this period, 1880 to 1915, they all started as pack peddlers because that was sort of a carryover from their homeland. And right here in America, with the Yankee peddlers, the same thing was going on, so it wasn't so strange. And what they, uh, what they peddled was uh, dry goods going into the, the small communities, and these people looked forward to the peddlers because that was the only way they were able to get their dry goods or rugs. Or, items like that. Well, like my grandfather, he was a pack peddler and from a pack peddler he was able to open up a bakery and in the in the bakery he had his four sons help him after school and then after that he bought a, a real estate a rental property and on Rondo Court where we lived that was one street there were eight houses there and he owned all those buildings besides buildings in other streets so he became quite wealthy, so his sons uh, served as carpenters, electricians, and helped him that way. And, and in, a lot, uh, in a lot of other families, people, uh, the sons or daughters who went to further school would leave school because they felt it was more lucrative to be with the, the parent, even if the parent didn't want them to, to leave school. The vast majority of the immigrants in the first wave were Christians. Busada's grandfather, for example, was a very pious man who prayed often. We talk about the Muslims uh, worshiping five times a day. My grandfather is a Christian. He worshiped five times a day. And his last prayer, which was like about five o'clock, if there were any young people in, 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 around, they would have to come upstairs and pray with him. He used to have a pillow on the chair and recite from the Bible. And, the kids would have to follow with them and, and, and speak in Arabic because we did have Arabic school and they learned. For the most part, during the first decades of this community's life in America, marriages were arranged, often between Arab communities in different parts of the country. My father's family, all the spouses 
were like one was from Canada, one was like Lawrence, my mother, one was from Pennsylvania, from uh, different places and d different places. That's what kind of impressed me. But at that time, they were arranged marriages, so my grandfather would contact the families and. And my grandfather would go with our Orthodox priest because a lot of the village, the the villages here in in America didn't have a, a church. Accordingly, Musada's upbringing was ecumenical. We had Arabic school all the time, but we we never really had a Sunday school. So our parents would let us go to the Methodist church or an Episcopalian church only to their Sunday school. And they permitted us to do that, and then we would go to our church. An industrialized city at one end of the Blackstone Canal linking Worcester to Providence in Rhode Island, Worcester attracted immigrants from many different countries. Busada recalls how the communities in which she grew up were ethnically diverse. Like 80 Wall Street, where, where I lived, that was the Arab home across the street was an Italian man. And then the huge uh, five-story building, those were all Lebanese Arab people. But, and next to them was a French house, a French home. All these ethnic groups, they, it wasn't ghettoized and they didn't assimilate. We all maintained our own national heritage. In spite of that, we still communicated, I mean they, the immigrants, communicated hand signals or else they would come over with tomatoes from the plant and then uh, uh, the Arab woman would give them uh, some kind of food. So there was this interchange without speaking the language. And everybody maintained their, their culture, their heritage. As a child, Busada reveled in her cultural ancestry at home, but was also shy about her ethnic culture in public. Growing up in an Arab American home, my mother always had Arabic food, and I loved it. And then the only thing is when I took my sandwiches to, to uh, work, uh, for lunch, I had to take Syrian bread, and because I was so embarrassed, the bread was wasn't like what everybody was eating. I would eat by myself in in the cafeteria restaurant. When I was through eating, I would go join the group. But today, all our Arabic food, our ethnic food, is is on almost any uh, menu in, in in America now. Hummus and uh, Syrian bread is called pocket bread. It was vogue in that time when I was growing up not to be a foreign. That was when I was outside at school and at work. Mm -hmm. But in my home, we were proud of it. But what I want to emphasize is like the men would always try to speak English at home. Mm -hmm. And then the mothers would definitely speak in Arabic. And for a good example, my mother went to the beach with the, with the wife of our priest who was a Russian woman. So my mother, an Arab woman, and this Russian woman went to the beach. And my mother called to check up on, to see how everything was and to let us know she's fine. I couldn't believe it was my mother on the other phone because she spoke perfect English. She just kept it away from us because she wanted us to keep talking in Arabic. But you can't help but pick up the English language and learn it. Musada loved the manifestations of Arab culture as they appeared in her childhood home, but was less than fully aware of the society and culture from which her ancestors came. This situation changed after high school. Opting to attend college for only one year, Musada began traveling, participating in archaeological digs, and rediscovering her heritage. I, I went to college for a year so I could put on my um, application for a job that I at least attended college but I just wasn't interested in college. I was more interested in traveling. She became a cultural activist in Worcester, though it was no small challenge to get an immigrant community less than eager to flaunt their difference to become politically active. Because our parents were so proud of being here in America and they loved the country so much. And even after the 67 war, it was so hard to get, get the Arab Americans to participate polit politically to state how unjust the war is and how they're defaming us. Because the parents were so loyal to America, a lot of the kids had that same loyalty, but luckily there were few of us that, uh, that mobilized and we brought uh, speakers to Worcester, in fact, like several times. One day this same speaker would speak 
at four different colleges during that same day. So there was this activism, but with maybe only about 10 people. But luckily, because it was so strange in the city that the newspaper would give us good coverage. <laughs> Nonetheless, Busada sees it as imperative for Christians and all people with a moral compass to get involved. I, I feel like as a Christian, I don't know how all these people can permit these things happening when they claim to be a Christian. But not only a Christian, and just to belong to the human race. As a member of the human race, and we all worship some almighty, whether he's God or Buddha, or, uh, uh, we should have some kind of a conscience. That's why I did it. Indeed, Busada, who sees herself as an activist and an educator, sees the promotion of greater understanding between Arabs and the rest of American society as an imperative. Uh, we have a need for mutual respect and acceptance of diversity. And to promote peace and understanding among the peoples of the world, we've got to show respect for one, one another. And hopefully, the reader of my book Arab American Faces and Voices will gain some new knowledge, respect, and trust about their fellow Americans, the Arabs and Muslims.